Hello. You are listening to the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast. We are here to walk with parents on their unwanted journey of child loss, guiding them to a place of hope, light, and purpose, not in spite of their child's death, but as a way to honor his or her life. And now, here is your host, author, speaker, and bereaved parent, Laura Deal. Hi, thank you for spending time here with me today. I want to remind you that I record from our home, which is the Hope Mobile, so you get to hear what I hear. Right now, we have walnuts falling and plunking on the roof, so you might hear an occasional clunk or a golf cart whizzing by or dogs barking in the distance since it's busy here this weekend. Last Easter season, I discovered someone who was doing an online video discussion over the Easter time frame talking each day about what was happening with Jesus, how it affected him, and how it speaks to us and helps us, especially those of us who have deep struggles in our lives and we're struggling with our faith. These discussions were being done by the author of a book. His name is Peter Gregg, and the book is called God on Mute, Engaging the Silence of Unanswered Prayer. I ended up buying the book, And it has taken me a while to get through it, just busyness and things. But this past week, as I read the chapter on the silent Saturday between Jesus' death and the resurrection, all I could do was think of so many of my listeners who struggle with why God is so silent when we need him more than we ever have before. So I decided instead of trying to put what I was reading in my own words, I'm going to do something really different. I'm just going to read this chapter of this book to you. Now, before I do, I want to share that this book was written out of Pete's own experience of the miraculous power of prayer alongside the pain of unanswered prayer and that common human struggle to find faith within that paradox. Just after God worked through Pete to birth a 24-7 prayer movement and the birth of his second child, his wife, Sammy, was diagnosed with a massive brain tumor. And surgery to remove the cancer was successful, but she has continued to suffer terrible epilepsy. And his deepest prayers for her healing just didn't work. And he struggled greatly with God and why he would allow this kind of a torturous thing to continue bringing constant pain and upheaval to their family, especially since at the same time, God was flowing through him to lead a prayer movement and he was witnessing wonderful and miraculous answers to prayers. And one thing he said is, suddenly I went from thinking that my prayers could save the world to questioning whether they could even save my wife. And this book, God on Mute, looks at Christ's own unanswered prayer through Gethsemane and Golgotha leading up to Easter Sunday or leading through to Easter Sunday where miracles arise, often when we least expect it. Now, I want to say that Pete's wife, that wasn't a miracle that has arisen in his life. She still suffers with constant and continual life-threatening horrific seizures for 20 years now. And she's had more ambulance rides to the hospital than they can count. So he wrote this book after he, you know, his own struggles of unanswered prayer, seeing God answer prayers here, but not answering prayers here, you know, where it's very personal and deep. And so this study that he did on this Easter week, he wrote this book to help deeply hurting people hang on to God when things don't make sense and when they need him more than ever before. So this is about how we get our heads around what he calls the unmiracles, the things that God doesn't do and the pain and questions that we all carry. So I have said quite enough. Let me go ahead and start reading. This chapter is called Exploring the Silence. No one really talks about Holy Saturday, yet if we stop and think about it, it's where most of us live most of our lives. Holy Saturday is the no man's land between questions and answers, prayers uttered and miracles to come. It's where we wait, with a peculiar mixture of faith and despair, whenever God is silent or life doesn't make sense. As we turn to explore the silence of God, we are compelled to address the problem of unanswered prayer more literally than we have done so far, examining the times when God simply doesn't reply to us when we pray. It's not that he's trying to say yes, no, or not yet to our prayers. 
It's that he's not saying anything at all. We pray and pray, but God remains silent. We ask for help, and he appears to ignore us. We try to make sense of our situation, and there is no explanation, no revelation, no intimation that God even cares. We may wonder if he's there at all. This experience of God's silence, or even his absence, is not uncommon in the Christian life, especially among those God uses most powerfully. It is an experience both epitomized and legitimized by the silence of God on Holy Saturday. The Bible opens with the voice of God. He speaks and life begins. It closes with what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, Revelation 19.1. In between these two cataclysmic moments, the story hinges on the word of God spoken in Jesus. The Bible is a book about a God who speaks, but it does not portray him as one who speaks incessantly to his people or to anyone else for that matter. Instead, we often endure holy Saturdays in which God's word is muted and his presence is veiled. In the wake of his wife's death, C.S. Lewis experienced this sense of God's silence and began to wonder, where is God? He says, when you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more empathetic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once, and that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present, a commander, in our time of prosperity, and so very absent to help in time of trouble? That was the end of C.S. Lewis's quote. Human beings can endure extreme pain in many years of unanswered prayer, provided they know God is present in the midst of it all and can say with the psalmist, even though I walk through the darkest valley, you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, Psalm 23, 4. We may not understand our suffering at such times, but at least we have the comfort of knowing God's presence in the pain. But sometimes, instead of the reassurances of God's word in the darkness, we only hear the bolting and double bolting of the door and after that, silence. As slaves in Egypt, the Israelites cried out to the God of their fathers, yet it would be 430 years before he spoke, saying, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering, Exodus 3.7. These forgotten people, who surely grew to question the dusty, old, desert legends of the Abrahamic covenant, these were the people who became the prime example in world history of what God can do. But it took the best part of 430 years. This seemingly unending stretch of the experience of the absence of God, writes Eugene Peterson, is reproduced in most of our lives, and most of us don't know what to make of it. When a man like Peterson says something, you really have to sit up and listen. Having spent decades studying every word of the Bible forensically in its original language, including seven and a half years working on his paraphrase translation, The Message, Eugene Peterson understands the broad sweep of Scripture far better than most. And from that privileged position, he makes this extraordinary observation. The story in which God does his saving work arises among a people whose primary experience of God is his absence. The question that screams out from a startling and depressing statement is simple and personal. Why? At the end of Hudson's, this is, Hudson is Peter Gregg's son, at the end of Hudson's first year at school, his report proposed an interesting objective for future success. Aim for next year, to reduce overall dependency on adult supervision. Reducing dependency on supervision is a spiritual process, too. God is committed to helping us mature, and to do this, he sometimes withdraws from our conscious experience by deliberately making himself less obvious and less immediately available, even by allowing some of our prayers to remain unanswered. 
when the prayers of an entire nation were rejected and Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, Jeremiah observed of God, you have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can get through. Lamentations 3.44. Why does God wrap himself in such a cloud? Why does he withdraw when we need him? Has he become less concerned about our needs than he once was? No more than Hudson's teacher had become less concerned about his progress. No more than we, as Hudson's parents, will love him less as he needs us less and grows to maturity. But in our love, we will, at times, withdraw and insist that he stand on his own two feet to face the challenges of life alone. When Hudson was learning to ride a bike, I used to run up and down the street holding him tight because I didn't want him to get hurt. But as long as he could feel my hands on his back and see me by his side, he couldn't, or wouldn't, balance. We spent many ludicrous hours like this, going back and forth at a 45-degree angle with me yelling, Now just let go of me. It's fun. You can do this. And him screaming, Are you crazy, old man? Do you want me to die? Eventually, someone took mercy on me and explained where I was going wrong. Instead of running alongside Hudson, they said, I needed to run behind him. And instead of allowing him to cling on to me for dear life, I needed to place my hand lightly on the back of his seat so that he could neither feel me nor see me. Of course, he hated this new arrangement. It didn't feel safe. He no longer felt supported. Sometimes he got extremely cross and announced that he didn't want to ride a stupid bike anyway. It was an uncomfortable lesson for both of us, but as long as he could feel me and see me, he would surely remain dependent on adult supervision. He was never going to master riding a bike. I allowed Hudson to get some scrapes and bruises because I loved him. I refused to answer his cries for help precisely because I cared. If we can't see God in our situation right now and can't feel his hands on our life, we may feel scared angry or helpless, or we may want to just give up altogether. Where once we could lean on God and life seem manageable with his help, now he seems to have abandoned us. The Bible assures us that God hasn't left us even when we can't feel his presence. Quite apart from the fact of his omnipresence, Jesus promised never to leave us or forsake us. On the cross, he endured complete forsakeness so that we would not have to. The Apostle Paul assured us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. The Bible leaves us in no doubt at all that when God is silent, he is not absent from his people, even if that's the way it feels. He is with us now as much as he ever was. He's no less involved in our lives than he was when we could hear his voice so clearly and could sense the joy of his smile. Instead, God has switched off for a while our ability to be conscious of his presence, and he has done this in order to reduce our dependency on outward things so that we may learn some vital lesson of life. Martin Luther argued that God withdraws and falls silent in order to draw us into the deeper relationship with him that is only possible when we move beyond merely outward experiences and purely rational understanding. If Luther is right, then the silence and unknowing of Holy Saturday are essential to growing deeper in our relationship with God. The silence of God is intentional. It is one of the great disciplines he puts on his children that we may share in his holiness, Hebrews 12.10. Such seasons are often described as the dark night of the soul, a term popularized by the 16th century mystic St. John of the Cross. In this time of dryness, he wrote, spiritual people undergo great trials. They believe that spiritual blessings are a thing of the past and that God has abandoned them. End of quote. This may sound like a crisis of faith, but John is quite clear that it is actually the exact reverse, a process of maturation. God is, as it were, removing the stabilizers from our bikes and his hand from our lives. As we grow towards spiritual maturity, Every believer is granted seasons of unanswered prayer when God is silent and may even appear absent from the world. At such times, we may be sure that God is weaning us off adult supervision, but that he has not abandoned us altogether. Psychologists say that healthy babies in their first 16 weeks don't have the capacity to believe in the object permanence of a thing if they can't actually see it. If you hide a toy, they immediately appear to forget it because they don't believe it exists anymore. 
But as their brain develops, they reach a stage where if you hide a toy, they will keep on looking for it. They begin to understand that objects exist even when you don't see them. This is a sign of Christian maturity, writes Nikki Gumbel, when we continue to believe in God's love even when we don't see or feel it. As we believe in the sun, even when it is not shining, we continue to believe in God's love, even in times of darkness when we don't feel his love. End of quote. It is one of the great ironies of life that our unanswered prayers can be used to craft the greatest answer to prayer that we will ever experience. When we first become followers of Jesus, we often enter a phase of spiritual infatuation, not dissimilar to the overwhelming obsession of falling in love. There can be tears, fascination, joy, and moments of deep intimacy. Our minds are full of God's wonder, and our lifestyles naturally reprioritize around our new, all-consuming relationship with God. Infatuation can be a vital time in our early spiritual formation, launching us out with abandonment and passionate pursuit of Christ for the rest of our lives, but it cannot and should not be protracted. Many studies have been conducted into the powerful and delightful chemical urges that occur when we fall in love. One recent report even compared human behavior at times to a form of madness. If you've ever experienced it, it's not hard to see why. However, we know that infatuation, which appears so selfless, is in fact profoundly self-centered. You only have to listen to the words of every love song in the charts to realize that the emotion of infatuation is all about how you make me feel, what I would like to do to you or what I want from you. Such caricatures of love barely compare with what they may one day become, the beautiful sight of an elderly couple walking down the street holding hands. Growing into maturity, whether it's in a romantic relationship, a child-parent relationship, or in a relationship with God, always involves a steady process of recentering from our own priorities and preferences to those of the other. That's why our center of gravity shifts as we mature spiritually. We begin to pray that God would change our hearts and rewire our motivation. We long to become more like Jesus. We ask God to help us become more humble, more loving, more faithful. It is an answer to these very prayers that God may decide to deny our requests and even withdraw a little from our lives. As long as it makes perfect sense to serve God and to live for Him, our faith can only mature so far. There's nothing very selfless or sacrificial in obeying God as long as it remains in our best interest to do so, enjoying His love, receiving miraculous provision, hearing His voice clearly, experiencing His reality in worship, gaining stimulating insights from the Bible, knowing God's comfort when we're hurting, and so on. Until these things are removed from our lives and we are left to stand alone without any reason for continuing except steadfast loyalty, we cannot truly mature from an us-centered relationship with God to a truly Christ-centered one. It isn't until the facts that once reinforced our beliefs are removed from our lives that we can truly live by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Now, I'm going to interrupt the reading here because I know it's, I just want to really emphasize that God did not kill your child for this purpose. He did not allow your child to die for the purpose of doing this. God knew the number of days that our children would have. He knew what was going to happen. And yes, for whatever reason we don't understand, he chose not to stop the death of each one of our children. But that's not why he allowed it to happen so that we would mature. He is allowing us to mature in this process. And I know it hurts, and I don't understand it, but we're going to keep reading, okay? But I just wanted to stop and, and just reiterate and just really make sure that I remind you God did not do this for this purpose, okay? Although seasons in our lives when God is silent may be important in our spiritual growth, they can also be deeply disturbing. As a result, we often attempt to solve the problem of God's silence with simplistic explanations of complex situations, lopsided applications of scripture, and platitudes of premature comfort. We are afraid to simply wait with the mess of problems unresolved until God himself unmistakably intervenes, as he did on Easter Sunday. We are unwilling to admit 
I don't have a clue what God is doing or why this is happening. We may even suspect that it would be unchristlike to cry out publicly, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So why can't we wait with the mess and pain of Holy Saturday unresolved? I went to the funeral of a friend named Simon who had died very suddenly of a heart attack, leaving behind a wife and four young children. It was unspeakably sad, especially as I watched his kids at the front of the church, pale as milk in their smartest clothes, trying to be so very brave and grown up and appropriate for us all, trying to make their daddy proud. One of the daughters played a piece on the recorder. Another did a reading and her voice hardly faltered. Then the pastor stood up and invited a band to lead us in a time of worship. We all sang songs, and to my surprise, some of the people in the front row started dancing. I know why they were doing it. They wanted to celebrate the fact that Simon was in heaven and that God was in charge. In a way, I loved them for the sheer defiant absurdity of it all. But then I saw something that almost broke my heart. We were singing the song, Show Your Power, O Lord, which had, according to the service sheet, been one of Simon's favorites, when his seven-year-old daughter turned her head and stared at the coffin. Show your power, O Lord, we continued, as she just kept staring at the coffin. It was a simple thing, but as I say, it almost broke my heart. A number of eulogies followed, and everyone said lovely things about Simon. One of the speakers explained how intricately God's hand could be seen in the timing of Simon's death. We believed him, we needed to believe him, but it seemed to me that for the four little faces on the front row, the timing could not have been more wrong. Their father had been this inevitable presence in their lives. He had been forever. Theories of death and providence no longer applied. Streets should empty. The Disney Channel should come off the air. In spite of all the singing, dancing, and detailed assurances, or perhaps because of them, I drove away later thinking how very fragile our faith must be if we can't just remain sad, scared, confused, and doubting for a while. In our fear of the unknowing, we leapfrog Holy Saturday and rush the resurrection. We race disconcerted to make meaning and find beauty where there simply is none yet. From dusk on Good Friday to dawn on Easter Saturday, God allowed the whole of creation to remain in a state of chaos and despair. Martin Luther dared to suggest, after Good Friday, and I imagine him whispering the words, God's very self lay dead in the grave. Is that possible? Can you imagine it? Nobody the disciples could look to for guidance. No basis for any hope. No meaning. We know for sure that the family and friends of Jesus were terrified. John says that they were gathered with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders in chapter 20, verse 19. And the apocryphal gospel of Peter says that the authorities were actively hunting Christ's followers down. The disciples were scared, but they were also profoundly confused. Had they been cruelly misled for three years? Had Jesus been merely a prophet and not the Christ at all? What of all the miracles, all the proof? Hadn't he predicted something like this? But surely God would not permit his son to be crucified. For the disciples, these questions would all be answered within a matter of hours in the most glorious way. When we experience similar seasons of doubt and despair, we too may be sure that resurrection is on the way. However, the experience of God's absence is not one to be rushed over as if it has no value in the Christian life. Quite the contrary, Holy Saturday has been the experience of many of the greatest saints in history, from St. John of the Cross to Mother Teresa. When Mother Teresa died in Calcutta at the age of 87, her diaries were collected by Roman Catholic authorities and taken back to Rome. Many were shocked, however, when they read her words and discovered the extreme inner turmoil experienced by the sainted nun and Nobel Peace Prize winner who always seemed so confident in her faith. For instance, we now know that Mother Teresa wrote in 1958, My smile is a great cloak that hides a multitude of pain. People think that my faith, my hope, and my love are overflowing and that my intimacy with God and union with His will fills my heart. If only they knew. In another letter she wrote, the damned of hell suffer eternal punishment because they experiment with the loss of God. 
In my own soul, I feel the terrible pain of this loss. I feel that God does not want me, that God is not God, and that God does not exist. In response to such revelations, the second Masegaro, Rome's popular daily newspaper, said, The real Mother Teresa was one for who one year had visions and who for the next 50 had doubts until her death. Commenting on this, one priest described Mother Teresa's doubts as a purification process, adding that it is also a part of sainthood. It's an argument reflecting a long Christian tradition that regards the experience of God's absence not as an enemy of faith, but rather as the very substance of greater faith and intimacy. Martin Luther goes so far as to call God Deus absconditus. Sorry about that. Don't know how to say it. Literally, the God who goes missing. The basis for this is Christ's own experience of forsakenness on the cross, a moment that speaks profoundly about the meaning of God's silence. We want God to answer our prayers through powerful interventions, admits Tim Chester, but in the cross we recognize by faith the presence of God in weakness. The silence remains silent, but we see in the cross the hidden God who is with us in our suffering. The heading of this section is really interesting. It's called Christ Became the Atheist. Never thought about that, right? Is he hung on the cross? A man who didn't believe since he took all of our sin? Okay, let's keep reading. One of the most shattering stories told by Ellie Weisel about life in Auschwitz darkly communicates this truth of God's absence. One day when we came back, you know what? I'm 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 not going to read this part because it's so graphic, but basically everyone in Auschwitz had to watch a hanging and there were three people being hung and one was a 10-year-old boy and they were forced to keep their eyes open and watch it and they were forced to walk past it and the boy took longer to die than the other two did and they were forced to watch this happen. For more than half an hour, this boy stayed there struggling between life and death. So let me keep reading here. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, where is God now? And I heard a voice within me answer him, where is he? Here he is. He is hanging here on this gallows. Any other answer to this devastating question would surely be blasphemy. We are left standing with the weasel aghast, doubting God's love, his power, or even his very existence. But of course, even as we stand in doubt, it dawns uncomfortably on us that this scene of such evil, this scene that indicates our belief in God, also graphically depicts the very crux of our faith. The New Testament scholar Rudolf Bultmann says that when Christ cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is possible that he was experiencing in that moment a total collapse of faith and meaning. The philosopher Albert Camus said of Christ's suffering, the agony would have been easy if it could have been supported by eternal hope, but for God to be a man, he had to despair. Jesus Christ may well have endured the same collapse, despair, doubt, rage, and loneliness that Elie Wiesel did on that day in Auschwitz, and that thousands have endured ever since. Renario Cantilamessa, preacher to the Palpal household, makes this startling possibility explicit. Christ, he says, of that cry from the cross became the atheist, the one without God, so that men might return to God. Is it really possible that at his moment of greatest need, Jesus did not suffer valiantly, defiantly, and strategically, but doubted his call and questioned the purpose of his intimate death and the message that he himself had preached? The previous day he had prayed, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. On Easter morning he would appear to Mary, and the tenderness of his love would shine as brightly as the evidence of his power. But in between these two acknowledgments of divine love and power, Jesus dies, and with him dies our hope. Perhaps, therefore, we must point to the boy on the gallows and concur bleakly with Weisel saying, There is God sounding for all the world like bitter atheists, which perhaps at such times we all are. There is love, dying for love, we say. There, hanging like flybait, is the one for whom everything is possible. There's a quote by P.T. Forsyth, No reason of man can justify God in a world like this. He must justify himself 
and he did so in the cross of his Son. The paradox of God's death in Christ and his presence in silence has been explored and experienced by many of the saints, including, as we have seen, Mother Teresa. It's an experience addressed by a school of thought known as apophatic or negative theology, which attempts to describe the nature of God by focusing on what God is not rather than what God is. Why? Because God must, by definition, confound human understanding a reality we experience in so much suffering. There are limitations to this highly mystical approach to faith. Although God is undoubtedly beyond our understanding, it is also important that we do not become too esoteric in the way we relate to him, as the gospel speaks loud and clear of a God who can be known, even if not fully understood, in human terms. In Jesus, we are told, God has been fully revealed, so our faith does not need to be blind. St. Teresa of Avila said that every difficulty in prayer comes from one fatal flaw, that of praying as if God were absent. I believe that negative theology, while helpful, doesn't take fully into account the fact that when God is silent, he is not absent. Surely he has promised, I am with you always to the very end of the age, Matthew 28, 20. At the start of this chapter, I quoted a passage from C.S. Lewis's memoir about his wife's death, in which he described God as a very absent help in times of trouble. However, as he continued to demand explanations for the pain he was enduring, he came to a different conclusion later in the book. When I lay these questions before God, I get no answer, but a rather special sort of no answer. It is not the locked door. It is more like a silent certainly not uncompassionate gaze, as though he shook his head, not in refusal, but waving the question like, peace child, you don't understand. Life is often confusing. We may experience the chaos of premature funerals, the inner turmoil endured privately by Mother Teresa, or even the public dereliction of faith suffered by Ellie Weisel in Auschwitz, but God does not leave us alone. Isaiah 49, 14 through 16 says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. In this chapter, we have explored the reality and significance of God's silence as the worst kind of unanswered prayer. We've seen that God sometimes falls silent and appears absent, not just in the pages of history, but also in the experience of every believer who longs to grow in his or her faith. We have also seen that it is important to embrace these painful seasons and not to deny them or rush through them. But this begs the question of how to do this. How do we move beyond mere endurance to active engagement with the unanswered prayers of our lives so that we can grow through them in eager anticipation of Easter Sunday? Well, as you may have guessed, that was the end of the chapter. And I am going to read the next chapter next week. It's a much shorter chapter, just letting you know, but he does talk about the how. And so, sorry to leave you hanging, but I'm going to since we're already at a long one here and I don't want to make it longer than it already is. So I hope this has begun to help you a little bit and just take this to the Lord, think about it, pray about it as we go through the week and we'll come together next week and talk about it some more. I know we have just hit September and some of us are going into some hot, hot days and some of us have hit some cold days. And if you're like us in Wisconsin, you're getting a little bit of both. But we're starting to think about the chilly fall weather that will be on us soon. Did you know that GPS Hope has long sleeve t-shirts? We have hoodies, sweatshirts, and jackets that have the ending podcast saying on them, hold on, pain eases, there is hope. You can wear a reminder to yourself and a message to others and keep yourself warm in the process as this fall, the chilly weather hits us this fall. Just go to our online store to see the different styles and sizes and colors at gpshope.org store. And I'll also put a link to it in the show notes. Let's get to today's birthday segment. 
Tony was born on September 4th and is forever 24. Alicia DeFranco was born on September 6th and is forever 24. Brady Keith Herbert was born on September 7th and is forever 30. Jacob Sorori was born on September 8th and is forever 32. Emma Ho was born on September 9th and is forever 10. Paul Murphy was born on September 9th and is forever 21. We celebrate the day that these children came into the world. We know it will always be a special and important day in the lives of these families. If you would like to have your child's birthday announced the week of his or her birthday, I would love to be able to do that for you. Just go to gpshope.org slash birthdays. Fill out the form there, including the pronunciation, if their name gets mispronounced sometimes, because I want to make sure I say it correctly for you. Submit that information, and I will announce your child's birthday the week of his or her birthday, and Dave will also send you an email to remind you to listen. I know it's so hard to comprehend but if God loves us, why would he be silent? And I think for a lot of us, I learn a lot being a parent on how Father God is, our Heavenly Father. And if I think about it, like we read about Pete talking about having to be absent from his son, having to pull back, but he wasn't absent, right? But he did have to pull back. And I know it just, when we're in the midst of the darkness of what we're going through, we still don't understand it. But as someone who has come through on the other side and has talked to so many other parents who have come through the darkest of the dark, and we've come through the other side, and I have talked to other parents who say, I, I mean, I know we're not the same person, none of us are, but we come out with, I can't put words to it, but there is something about our relationship with God that has grown in a way that it wouldn't have any other way. And like I already said, God did not do this to us for the purpose of maturing us or growing in intimacy with him. This is something that he's inviting us into in the process of what has happened. We are being given an invitation to stay faithful to him. I don't understand it. It doesn't seem like he's here. I don't understand why he would allow this much pain in my life, but I'm going to hang on to him with everything I have until I come out of this darkness and I can see him and feel him again and hear him again. I was talking to my daughter just a couple days ago about some situation she's in, and she was just telling me how sorry she was about she never realized until the situation she's in right now how much pain I was in when Becca died and when she walked away from the family, from her own pain and vulnerability and what that did to me and the hurt and the pain it caused me. And she was crying and just saying she just feels so bad about all of that. And the thing is, I I told her, but I went through it. And that's, to me, that's the biggest thing. I went through it, and the whole re the only reason I could get through it was because God was with me. I may not have felt him at times, but I hung on to him with everything I had because I was like, Peter, where else can I go? I don't know where else to go. And so that may, and I told my daughter that because God got me through such a dark, dark place that I didn't think it was possible to come out the other side, that's caused me to love him even more. And that's my prayer for you that you will hang on to God with everything you've got so that you will come through the other side of this deep, deep darkness in love with him even more, knowing that your child is in love with him even more because they can see who God really is and they can see the full picture that we can't see right now. So with that, let me close out and remind you to hold on. Pain eases. There is hope.